Welcome first. Uh, welcome for uh, our first uh, XMPP Academy, Process One XMPP Academy. Uh, one thing to note is that I would like to, to thank you very much for uh, all the questions I received uh, for this uh, first first edition. This is very uh, very uh, encouraging, and uh, yeah, we we have a lot of materials to cover, uh, even if this is the the first session. So for the first session, we have received uh, quite some. Uh, a few questions, a few questions on uh, eJabberty uh, software as a service, eJabberty SaaS architecture, which is a uh, process one offering to get access to eJabberty business edition, but at a, a, a much, a much uh, cheaper cost uh, and fully managed by process one. So we got, we got a few questions on, on uh, eJabberty SaaS architectures and we got a few questions on uh, more generally on XMPP and eJabberty. So, Let's start by uh, eJabberty SaaS architecture question, which will also be very interesting if you only if you are only into eJabberty because it will cover some of the specific of eJabberty uh, by itself. So uh, first, before addressing the question, uh, what I propose is to uh, to explain how uh, eJabberty SaaS uh, architecture is working in relation with uh, your own backend as a customer. So what you need to know is that eJabberty SaaS is designed to be easy to integrate into your own architecture. So basically what you can do is you can manipulate through API eJabberty SaaS data, but you can also, and this is much more interesting, uh, plug eJabberty to your own backend. So we, we, we have endpoint uh, that we can use uh, to connect to your own backend. This is HTTP uh, endpoint. So if you implement those endpoint and reply to those uh, API in the way we expect, we can build a, yeah, a whole uh, uh, consistent architectures. So it's designed with scalability and uh, high availability in mind. It's designed to be as stateless as possible, meaning that if we need to kill Jeopardy and restart it, mostly uh, we, we even have no data to restore. So it, most of the data should be handled on your end, on your backend. So it's easy to integrate with your own backend and the data are supposed to, rely, uh, to be stored in your own backend. So be as stateless as possible. And this is, of course, as a goal is to keep you, the customer, in control of the data. So we deploy Jabberty uh, SaaS platform, we plug to your uh, own backend, we don't duplicate the data as much as possible. Uh, you will see that in a, in, in a later slide. And uh, you keep control of the data. I mean that if you need to, uh, uh, to move to another solution, you move, you move to uh, your own uh, Jabberty managed platform, no problem but that you have the data so you don't have to plan a, a very costly or difficult migration. This is seamless. And uh, as such, WD SaaS works in two modes. The first mode is what you know, uh, basically, uh, what is eJabberty about is stateful. Most of the data are managed by eJabberty. In that case, eJabberty SaaS. You have database that are uh, deployed in that eJabberty SaaS infrastructure. And Basically, you, you make uh, API, API calls to create uh, create uh, users, to create uh, contact list rosters, and, and so on. And the second mode, which is the one we recommend, is fully stateless to, to, to leverage our ability to integrate with your own backend. All or most of the data are on your backend. So that, that's the one we recommend. Uh, that's the mode we recommend. So here is uh, the architecture uh, in stateful mode. So as you see, this is basically in the middle, uh, you see your user at the top, uh, you see mobile, desktop, web browser connecting to through load balancer uh, managed by process one, getting through eJabberty uh, instant messaging cluster, eJabberty business edition. And uh, you see that in relation to that, we have our own database which is managing users, password, rosters, missile archive, uh, offline messages, everything is managed locally. And you control that 
by using EJBRD API, REST API, or XML RPC API. So basically, you can manage user uh, remotely, you can manage contact list, and you can do a lot of things that are exposed through, uh, through the API. But as you see here, we have a main issue, especially for user and contact list, as you probably already have your own user base and your own uh, way to manage uh, your, uh, friends for your users. So this is the, there is a the big risk is that data can are duplicated so they, they, have a, they can get out of sync. So it's, you're in charge of making sure that, uh, yes, when you create a user, when user uh, uh, on your back end, you will create it in JRBD when user store, uh, change the password, you will modify it into JRBD as well. So this is very something which is, can lead to a database being out of sync. So this is why we don't recommend that mode and we recommend the second mode, which is uh, fortunate enough, which is uh, fortunately uh, allows you to keep the control of the data and is the, really the best for you. So here you see that at the bottom, we have eJabberD not uh, receive uh, incoming connection to, uh, to be manipulated by your backend, but instead are doing outgoing requests so when, when a user wants to authenticate, it will get through load balancers into EJBRD and make uh, a REST uh, API call to your own backend to make sure that that user has the right to authenticate. And we, you don't have to create any user on our end. We always check on your backend. That's the same for uh, contact list rosters. Uh, when we need it, when the a user logs in and require request, uh, is roster, we get to your, to your backend, get the most up-to-date uh, version of the contact list, and we send that back to the user. And we do the same with uh, message archive. So when, when, a, when a user posts a message, uh, it is archived on your backend. When a user uh, receives a message, it is also archived on your backend. So you can decide what you want. You can just use uh, authentication on your backend and let us manage data for roster, contact list, and uh, missile archive, or you can decide to uh, manage all the three, uh, user, roster, and missile archive. And as you see, as a consequence, uh, eJabberD SaaS database contains much less uh, persistent data. So the next one, the last one, which is very important, maybe offline messages, and we are already in the process of uh, adding a REST API so that you can store offline messages on your own backend if you implement that API as well. So we are moving more and more data to your backend so that you, you are in control, basically. You can do whatever you want, and you have more flexibility to, uh, to manage uh, your own uh, infrastructure in a proper way. So now I hope you get the big picture of what we did for EJBRD. We want something, I think no one else did that. We were, uh, when you, usually when you think software as a service, uh, you have uh, everything handling one in single place, the data and the service itself. In our approach, we give you the control and we uh, make you in charge of the data and we manage basically what is difficult to do for you and what we do very well, which is manage a very high and large scale XMPP service. So now it's time to get back to the question. With that uh, in mind, it will be easier to, uh, to understand the reply to, to the question we have received for this first uh, XMPP Academy. So the first question was, what is the best way to archive user messages if we do not want to sync data from user device? Actually, it's not dependent at all on whether the user device will sync data or not. Uh, previously, for those who have been doing XMPP since a very long time, the way to archive message was uh, XEP 136, which was message archiving. It is today mostly deprecated and is 
obsoleted by uh, the MAM, the Message Archive Management ZEPS 313, uh, which is a new way to archive messages. And what is good is that this specification plays nicely with other uh, newer XMPP feature. Uh, this is today's specification for archiving. There is no doubt about that. So don't hesitate. Go straight to that uh, to that ZEP to to implement Message Archiving. And even if you don't not plan to let do not plan to let user download messages from the from the server to the client to resync. Uh, between uh, multiple devices and, and so on. If it, even if you don't plan that, if it's just for audit purpose, this is still uh, the, the, exact, the specification to use. So I will add a specific note for uh, EJRD SaaS. In EJRD SaaS, you can implement it in two ways. So if you remember my diagram, you can have the data on, on EJRD SaaS and we will take care of them for you, or you can control uh, the data and receive the request for each message that is sent or received by your user. So you will get the message in real time, basically. This is likely what bring, uh, what brought the second question, which is what does EJRD SAS uh, not use async mechanism for achieving messages to customer server. So basically what we do is that each time we receive a message, when we have a message to archive, we post uh, an HTTP request to your backend when, uh, when you manage that data, those data. So actually, each already is an XMPP server. And an XMPP server basically is a buffer. You have people uh, client connected on one end that are sending messages to other user and even if this is very transient we are buffering that so if your uh, the receiver is on a very slow connection uh, we will buffer that to make sure that all messages get delivered uh, so we, we we do some buffering but any buffering so each is in, in the middle of uh, sending client receiving client and basically it's like a pipe so if after some time you try to send more data into eJeopardy than uh, the receiving party can accept well the buffer of eJeopardy grows and it can grow up until the point where it cannot cope with that anymore it, it, it will blow up so we have protection against that to avoid uh, blowing up and we can drop some messages if needed, drop some buffers if something really bad happened. But basically, uh, eJeopardy being a central part, it makes it very fragile. So you have to buffer in a smart way. You cannot buffer everything because you, you, you will end up exploding at some point. So in, uh, in architecture for scalability and robustness, uh, we need to write uh, everything to the final destination as fast as possible. So that's why we don't buffer method archive code. We write them and we pass them to, uh, to uh, the, the backend uh, API. It happens that that backend API is really easy to scale. Basically, you can have, this is HTTP, this is mostly stateless. You receive a request and you write in the database. So the, all the problem is about scaling the database. But today, there is a lot of databases that can scale uh, yeah, almost linearly across uh, uh, a very large set of nodes. So for example, if you use RIAC from the company called Basho, if you use RIAC database, you can have 20 nodes just in charge of writing data uh, for, those, uh, for those users with the proper front end to accept the data and you will be fine. So this part is very easy to scale. It also means that as a customer, it puts you uh, in control. You receive the message uh, uh, live as they are posted or received by, uh, by your users. So you can do smart thing about that. You know that a, a user just received a message uh, and on your back end, you can write that in the web archive 
so that if the user go uh, to your uh, website, the archive will be up to date and have no delay. Or you can do smart thing, uh, send a, an email summary after receiving uh, yes a few uh, a few messages and so on. So you can you you're in control. We we pass you the information in real time and you're in control uh, about what to do with this information. The other thing is that we uh, it make you possible it make it possible for you to load balance or chart the data, meaning that if we request if you send a write request to your backend for a given user, you can use that user ID to decide in your load balancer that you want to put move that request to that. Uh, specific node. So, request for GID one at your domain will go to node one in your backend, and request for uh, GID two will go to node two, and, and so on. So, you can partition the data and make it easier for you to scale your backend. If we aggregate and buffer messages from different users and send that to you as a single blob, then you cannot shard. Uh, the your uh, in partition you use the base that way, so this is this is not good for scalability on your end. Even even if it suits a good idea, it actually it's not. So uh, yes, I hope to have, cl to have clarified why we don't buffer uh, Mesa archive uh, calls to your backend API. Third question is about mobile support. And I've been asked to explain what is standby, what is push, what are what is standby push mode, and, and so on. A lot of things we, we, we do in our Bombard stack. And what you need to understand is that XMPP was designed at a time where basically there was no mobile. Uh, wi Fi was even uh, really rare <laughs> at that time, and you were all mostly connected to your network through uh, an internet cable. So, what is important to know is that it was, XMPP was designed to cope with constantly running TCP session. And where you were disconnected, you were simply offline. With smartphone and uh, smartphone application, uh, manufacturers have put some limit of what the application can do. Uh, with the goal of saving battery life. So when the users put uh, your messaging application in the background, uh, it will not be able to, uh, uh, to stay uh, connected for a long time, a matter of minutes. When you go to, uh, you put the, uh, your application in the background, a few minutes later, uh, the app, at most, the app will be uh, disconnected from network. So we have to cop and to make the two mode, to make it to make XMPP uh, friendly with the way uh, application of smartphones operates, and yeah, fortunately it uh, can work very well. So, just to explain you how it works, here is the standard XMPP client to server state machine. So, your session is closed. You open TCP, IP, and stream. The stream is open, you log in and you have a session established, basically, and you can, if you close the stream or the TCP IP connection, your session is closed. Very basic, very straightforward. With mobile, you have to do more things uh, for, and add more states uh, in the station after the session is established. So, this is, uh, how it works with our XMPP mobile uh, mobile uh, stack. So, as you see, we still have the session uh, closed, session open, and session established states. But but we can get richer uh, in uh, from the, from the point the session is, is established. So the first thing you can do is enable push mode. So when uh, push mode is enabled, you have a session with push mode uh, push mode enabled. It means that uh, you can uh, close the connection and you will be on the far right 
of the diagram and will be a, a, in a detached mode session. So uh, it means that the session is still there, but uh, you can uh, receive push notification, uh, but, but you, you don't have any TCP uh, IP uh, connection to, uh, to our server and uh, you will be notified of your message through uh, Apple uh, push notification service or Google GCM uh, push notification service. So this is one of the mode uh, where you, you can leverage. When the session expires, the session is closed again and uh, the user can open a TCP connection uh, and rebind to the session and it will go straight to the session with push enable mode. So no need to re-authenticate, ask roster and, and everything again and it will receive uh, the new messages and the presence, just the relevant difference uh, uh, of all the things that happened while uh, the session uh, was disconnected. So this is really, really handy and very uh, smart. And we have a, another mode, which is a standby mode, which is also uh, uh, defined in the XMPP standard as uh, uh, the CSI. And basically what, what you can do is that if you want to save, to stay connected but save bandwidth, you can go into a standby or inactive mode and uh, our server will limit the traffic, for example, filter the presence. You don't need presence if you're not actively looking at the screen because it will change a lot of time uh, per hour's presence of your contact. So what you, what you need is when you get active again, uh, you need all the presence to uh, the last presence update to be sent back to you. Uh, because you're actively watching at your uh, smartphone screen and you want to see the status of your user and you want it to be up to date. So this is optional. Uh, standby mode is not always implemented. What is always implemented is uh, on mobile is the data station mode because it allows fast reconnect and uh, it allows uh, push notification, integration with push notification. So this is basically what is uh, what is uh, important to know regarding our, our XMPP mobile stack, which is available in the JavaD business edition, but also in the JavaD SaaS, so you can use it uh, uh, in a very cost-effective uh, way. So next question, uh, how does JavaD internally store messages with, which are not yet delivered? So. Uh, when, message, when a message is not delivered, uh, it can be because uh, of several situations. Session, the first situation is session is established with a TCP connection attached, but uh, then suppose the client does not support message ACK. So in that case, uh, there is a t uh, leaving TCP connection uh, on the server and the client does not support message act. So what we do is simply message, we send message directly on the TCP socket and they are deleted from memory and not buffer, not cached. We, we send them, just send them and we don't store them. And when that's done, they're, they're gone. It's uh, in the buffer, uh, in various buffer, in the various stage of your uh, TCP chain between the server and uh, your client. If the client support message ACK, then the buffered are mis uh, uh, the messages are buffered uh, in the in the session until uh, uh, they have been acted by the receiving client. So when the client say, "Okay, I got the message," we we remove them from uh, from memory. If the session timeout and the message have not been Acknowledge. Uh, we uh, we simply put them in offline in offline storage, and then when the client reconnect, when the user reconnect, uh, it will uh, get the message through that uh, offline store. The second uh, situation case is uh, the session is established, but it is in data mode, so you don't have a TCP connection open and available to send the message. So we, we, we do 
almost the same that in the uh, client reporting message ac ac uh, acknowledgement case. A message are buffered in the session and they are sent back to the user on reattach. When the user reattach, he will receive the difference. What happened for a session when uh, it was TCP disconnected. Uh, and if the session expires uh, before the user reattached to it, the message are stored uh, for offline delivery and uh, the user will receive them when, uh, when, he, when he connects again, when he, when he opens a new session. And the, the third case is if there is no session for the user, so someone is writing to you, but you are not, you are not online and you don't have any session at all, then message are directly stored uh, in the offline storage, which is uh, a local uh, database, which is local to the EWG SaaS uh, platform. So next question is, uh, how priv privacy list is managed uh, in EJWG? So, well, this is reply, this reply is very straightforward. Uh, EJWG supports XEP uh, 16 privacy list type. This is the most complete and co complex one, but we, we support it, uh, uh, no problem about that. We also support blocking commands, uh, which are defined in uh, XEP 191, and uh, you can enable them together and use them to all together on the same server, no problem about that. So both specification can be used together on a single backend. So that are stored in the Jabberdy database uh, and it supports various backends. So you can store that in MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL, RIAC, Nesia, and Jabberdy internal database. So you have the choice of where you want to store your offline messages. And we, we, we don't have, in Jabberdy SAS, we don't have a REST backend uh, for offline, uh, for privacy list because privacy lists are needed basically on each message sent or received. So we need to consult uh, and to refer to privacy list to know does this message or uh, need to be blocked. And for performance reason, we don't want to query uh, and to make HTTP call uh, to check. Uh, if a message can or cannot be sent because we will be introducing too much latency uh, in the messaging process from a sending client to a receiving client. And uh, the last question is, what is on the eJobity roadmap? And as you may be aware, eJobity 15.09 is about to be released in September. So probably tomorrow or the day after. Uh, and it will include a, really a huge feature. We will be introducing OO support for EJABRG. Uh, this is a huge feature. We have been working on that feature for, for several months now. And it it's really will change dramatically the face of EJABRG and the face and the way XMPP is used in uh, relation with web application. So it's good for security because uh, as a client developers, uh, actually as client developers can uh, develop a client where the user can set up the account without, without giving uh, the password to the client. So the client doesn't have to cache the password locally to be able to reconnect because using OAuth, it will get a token from the server. It will never see the user password. It will just see a token that can be later revoked by the user. And uh, it will use that to connect uh, to, uh, to Jabberdy, so to authenticate uh, to Jabberdy through uh, XMPP, a, spe a specific SISL uh, XMPP authentication mechanism, XOAuth2. This is also a very big uh, announcement because user can delegate rights to other third-party application. You can let a third-party service send message or post in the chat room on your behalf. So you can do, you can build a Slack-like application where you can uh, let uh, GitHub uh, post to uh, to your uh, developer chat room 
using a token that you will be uh, ending uh, GitHub through an old mechanism, uh, an old dance. It's called an old dance. Uh, and you can integrate with a, a large, very large number of uh, third parties through OAuth and delegate a lot of things to other client to other uh, services online. So you can expect in the coming weeks to see uh, online services supporting that mechanism to be able to post uh, to your XMPP service uh, on behalf of their user. So if you have a common user base. Uh, a user base, a user using your service can delegate uh, rights uh, to another service uh, they are also using. So it will make it really uh, uh, XMPP and eJeopardy very web uh, friendly. Uh, if you, even if you don't want to integrate with third-party services, online services, it will be handy, very handy for you. To build a micro service architectures, so you can have all the components of your architecture speak to Jabberdy through an HTTP REST API using uh, tokens uh, and not uh, admin credential, for example. So this is very very handy, and and you can also define the scope of the right you want to delegate. So. You, want, you can scope uh, to a very specific API call only and you can have a token that will be only authorized to use uh, that specific call, API call. So this is really, really uh, wonderful to build uh, microservice architectures. This is also great for uh, Internet of Things support. So you think your things will be able to do stuff uh, without the need to fully speak XMPP. So one, one example I like a lot is that, for example, the Apple Watch uh, or any, any smartwatch uh, is able to do some network operation, but it's limited to HTTP operation. So if you want to display on your watch, for example, the count, how many offline messages do I have on my XMPP account? Uh, you cannot do that on your watch today without getting through uh, talking to your phone and your phone making a, uh, opening an XMPP session and, and so on. So by allowing uh, things to use HTTP API to do stuff on your behalf, we're opening a whole new world of opportunity uh, for your things to do stuff for you. So with that way, I can have my uh, watch call uh, the get offline message count uh, API endpoint using my token, using HTTP, and it will get back how many message uh, do I have in my message store. And I can display that directly on my watch uh, without my watch having to maintain a persistent connection and having to speak any XMPP at all. And it cannot at the moment. So this is a good thing for the Internet of Things. And basically, you can also build an ecosystem. You can grant limited rights to your partners. So if you're building a platform for your users, you can grant rights to your partners using token. You can delegate stuff uh, and operation to, to third party and partners. So this is also great if you're planning to, to put eJabberdy at the center of a larger uh, ecosystem and, uh, um, and gathering of uh, various partners. So yeah, the conclusion is that eJabberdy is a new eJabberdy uh, to be released in the, in the next few days and OAuth support is really a way to seamlessly merge XMPP with HTTP. XMPP love HTTP. HTTP will love uh, XMPP. And both uh, kind of developers that had uh, trouble speaking with each other will now be a uh, very friend again because they, they can uh, talk to the same server uh, in a seamless way. So we hope you really enjoy uh, this first uh, XMPP Academy. 
it will happen in about a month again. Uh, we will announce that uh, for the next uh, XMPP Academy very soon. But you can always uh, put uh, in the comment of, on, on the video uh, the kind of uh, question you would like to, to or topic you would like uh, us to address. You can send us to contact at pros1.net. You can send us questions that you want us to cover in the next XMPP Academy session. And yes, we, we hope to have a uh, uh, learn you a fair bit of uh, XMPP. I've shared our uh, deep uh, XMPP and Xabardi knowledge with you. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for for the next uh, the next edition. Thank you guys. It was uh, great speaking with you.